Uh, thank you so much for inviting me, for having me here. Uh, in 15 minutes, I will argue that migration uh, has a, an undeniable power for global development. And I'm talking about the world, I'm talking about individuals, and I'm talking about countries. Uh, I'm going to review several recent uh, research papers, a few of them by me, and I'm going to argue that the new round of development goals coming in September cannot ignore the power of migration for development. It is an opportunity that cannot be missed. So this is a chance to look back at how it went the last time that we formulated development goals. Uh, I was around, I remember it. If you pick up the 2001 roadmap to implementing the Millennium Development Goals adopted by the General Assembly in 2001, you will find migration mentioned in three contexts only. You will find that migrants are frequently victims of discrimination and racism. You will find that migration has led to an increase in epidemics contributing to the global malaria problem. And you will find that rural-urban migration, quote, tends to increase poverty, unquote. And that's it. These are the only three contexts in which migration is mentioned at all in the 2001 roadmap to implementing the Millennium Development Goals. Now, I think a lot of us in this room, as uh, the introduction has pointed out, are long past that now. It was a while ago, we're in a different frame of mind now. I think the entry point for a lot of people to reconsider some of the, the ideas motivating statements like these has been uh, remittances. So here are data released three days ago by the World Bank comparing different kinds of resource flows to developing countries. Remittances in yellow, aid in white on this graph. And I think it's common knowledge now that remittances to developing countries are multiple times the size of foreign aid. And not just that, but they're fundamentally different from the foreign aid. Large fractions of foreign aid goes to pay the salaries of expatriate experts, uh, office rent in Washington, D.C. Remittances, in turn, go, for the most part, directly to the pockets of workers and families in developing countries. Um, not just that, though, but look back in 2001. Remittances already, at the time that the roadmap was being written, were much larger than foreign aid. They were about two-thirds larger at that time than foreign aid. Really, the previous effort was just out of step with how the world was then, and now it's just dramatically greater. So this is something I, I think we already know. I mention it because of its great importance. I think everybody has realized now that remittances are a big part of the story. But right here, right now, today, I want to ask you to go beyond that. Because I think remittances are just the first step and not even a very big step to appreciate the, the, the critical importance of global migration to development. Um, I want to talk about some research, as I mentioned, in three different categories at the level of the world economy, at the level of household economies, and finally, stressing uh, countries. Because I know that many of you are here representing countries. So let's start with the world. Uh, one of the most fascinating aspects of the world economy to me is that the labor of the same person doing the same thing can sell for massively different prices in different places. That is, it's common for uh, the labor of this guy hammering a nail into a board to sell in, for $250 a month in one country and $2,500 a month in another country. Leigh Pritchett, Claudio Montenegro, and I gathered data on these kind of gaps uh, between 42 countries and, the, uh, and uh, the United States in a paper that I'm trying to call up now called The Place Premium. Um, when you think about it for a second, that's an arbitrage opportunity. When one thing sells for a gigantically different price in one place than in another place, that's an opportunity to add value by moving goods and services across that gap. Not zero sum, not taking value from one place to another, but actually increasing the size of the world economy by exploiting the gap. Um, which is why when you uh, add up the gains that are available from moving movements of this kind, they're so large per person that even relatively small movements of people add up to gigantic numbers at the world level. So the bottom line uh, is that if you add up economists' best estimates 
of all the gains that are left at the global level from the total elimination of every remaining policy barrier to trade, every tariff, every quota, plus the gains available from eliminating every remaining barrier to capital flows. Together, you get a total that is less than $3 trillion a year in added value available from those changes. But even a modest relaxation of labor mobility barriers beats that in quantitative terms. That is, uh, if you were to allow one in 20, one in 20 workers in low-income countries to supply their labor to advanced economies, that alone would add more value to the world economy than the aforementioned change in trade and capital mobility. That is more than, somewhere much more than $5 trillion a year. Um, this is discussed in a paper called Trillion Dollar Bills on the Sidewalk, where I survey all of the papers that have tried to estimate these numbers. Now, that arbitrage opportunity has a, a different implication. There's a different lens through which to look at the fact that the same person doing the same thing is worth, in economic terms, massively more in one place than another. And it's that mobility itself, crossing a border, can be at the margin the most effective route out of poverty for certain households. When people ask me, uh, what is the effect of migration on poverty in Haiti, let's say, uh, I pose to them a different question. I say, of the poverty reduction that has occurred for Haitians, what fraction involved labor mobility? That should give you an idea of how important mobility should be in the global agenda for poverty reduction. And the answer to that question is most of it. So here's what I mean by that. Uh, if I set a poverty line of $10 a day at New York prices, now this is a poverty line that is above the extreme poverty lines that say the World Bank uses, but it is destitution by a standard meaningful to anybody in this room. For example, the US poverty line for a single adult is over $30 a day. and we're we're talking about $10 a day at the same prices. Poverty at $10 a day, and I show you 100 Haitians, people born in Haiti who are not poor by this definition of poverty. That is, they live over $10 a day at US prices. And I just tell you, they live either in the US or Haiti. So the question is, of people who fit this description, how many of them live in the US and how many of them live in Haiti? And the answer is that 82 People born in Haiti who are not poor by this definition live in the U.S. and not in Haiti. This is the poverty reduction that has occurred because of everything else that happened. All of the technology transferred to Haiti, all of the trade preferences for Haiti, all of the investment promotion for Haiti, all of the NGOs, church organizations. And this is the poverty reduction that happened because of leaving Haiti. So I'm obviously not calling for everybody to leave Haiti. I am calling for recognition of the fact that if there is to be a global development agenda that does not take into account the principal source of poverty reduction for people born in certain countries, that's not, I would strongly claim, a serious global <coughs> poverty reduction agenda. But let's focus on countries, because as I said, uh, we're at the UN, Th those numbers are in, a, are in a paper called uh, Income Per Natural. We do it for a few other countries as well, India, Mexico. Let's talk about countries. Um, now, why have remittances been so prominent on the global development agenda? To me, and this is, this is more of a psychological claim that I don't have any expertise to make, I think it represents a mentality that I encounter often in talking about development, which is that migration and development are antithetical. They are opposites. Migration happens when development doesn't. And to the extent that we can encourage my, uh, development, we will have less migration. Um, there's some recent and very interesting research that suggests precisely the opposite. That development happens along with and in part because of migration, not instead of migration. And I want to show you what I mean by that. Um, this is the cross-sectional relationship, just a correlation across countries between income per capita in real terms, purchasing power parity, and the fraction of your population that is outside the country 
as measured by showing up in a, an OECD census. So this is not all immigration, but it is most immigration. And the solid blue line here, 1990, then 2000, then the dotted white line, 2010. These are in the UN bilateral migration stocks as compiled by Bella and colleagues. And what you can see is something remarkable, that when, when countries go from being very low income, uh, Ethiopia, Niger, to being middle income, Colombia, Albania, the migrant stock in 1990 doubled. Now it triples. That is, there's nothing like the intuitive relationship between more development and less migration until you're an upper middle income country, and then it matches our priors. The same thing holds if you look at migration flows. Those were stocks, fraction of your population outside. This is the uh, percent of your population that leaves during the decade of the 90s in red and the 2000s in the dotted white line. Again, going from Niger, Ethiopia to Albania, Colombia, the flow, decadal flow of migrants rises and rises and rises as the country gets richer. Now what's going on? Uh, I talk about uh, uh, research in, in economics, sociology, uh, demography on this subject in a paper called Does Development Reduce Migration? A lot of the theories revolve around alleviating credit constraints, that is that people get richer, they can afford the kinds of things that allow them to leave countries. Uh, it is related to demographic changes that are occurring uh, along with the development process, but not just that. These numbers suggest that there is something about development going from poor, from low income to middle income that is actually part and parcel of movement. That is, they are different aspects of the same thing. Again, development as a result of migration, not instead of migration. Uh, embodied, I think, by this guy. I think everybody recognizes Mohammed Ibrahim, founder of Celtel International, billionaire uh, from Sudan. He was working as an engineer in the National Telecoms Agency of Sudan in Khartoum when he decided to leave, and he never went back. He did a master's degree, then founded a company internationally, and has lived and worked outside since. And the, the traditional development agenda would ask only two questions about Mo Ibrahim. Did he go back and work as a low-level engineer in the National Telecoms Agency in Khartoum? And did he send money to his cousins every month? And anybody who knows a little bit about Mo Ibrahim can imagine how meager that vision of this guy is. Through the lens of research, uh, economists have shown that migration causes technology transfer. So there's, there's a remarkable paper by Bill Kerr of Harvard Business School where he documents this through patent citations. To make a long story short, if you're an Indian filing a patent in India, citing a patent that was filed in the United States, you are 30 to 50% more likely to cite a patent filed by an Indian in the United States than by a non-Indian. That is, knowledge is not just flowing through the air, through the internet somehow, it's flowing through people, it's flowing through networks, and those networks are exclusively created by migration. Um, there's a brand new paper by Danny Bahar of the Inter-American Development Bank and Hillel Rappaport of the Paris School of Economics documenting the effects of that technology transfer, that migration can shape the comparative advantage of nations. They, they gather product, product level data on the basket of goods that countries are able to produce and export and track when countries add new products to the basket of goods they're able to produce and export. And what they document is that uh, if you have a larger stock of migrants in countries that already are producing a particular good, you are much more likely to add that good to your basket of goods that you can produce and export in the following 10 years, embodying the technology transfer that, uh, that Bill Kerr is talking about, changing the comparative advantage of your country. Um, the same is true of capital flows and good flows. So uh, Beata Jovorjic and co-authors in the Journal of Development Economics have shown that migrant networks cause FDI flows. That is, a 10% increase in the stock of migrants, skilled and unskilled, uh, 
uh, from a developing country in the United States is associated with a 3% increase in the stock of foreign direct investment from the United States back to the country those people came from. And when it's skilled migrants in particular, it's a 5% increase rather than 3 Greater uh, effect for, for skilled migrants, but a, a quite large effect for migrants in general. Same for trade. So here, uh, I'm talking about work by Gabriel Febermeyer and Fabi Tual uh, in, uh, I believe this is World Development, where they show that a, a, a similar relationship between overall migrant stocks and imports and exports with the country of origin, again, more pronounced for skilled migrants, but quite substantial for migrant networks in general. Finally, less tangibly, institutions and norms have been shown to flow through international migrant networks. So here I'm talking about a paper in the American Economic Review by Antonio Spilimbergo, where he shows that countries that send more foreign students abroad to study in more democratic countries tend to become more democratic themselves, as measured by the Freedom House uh, Political Rights Index. Um, migrant spread fertility norms. So here I'm talking about a paper by uh, Michel Ben, Frédéric Dorquier, and Maurice Schiff, where they show that a 1% decline in the average fertility in countries where your country sends migrants to causes in the following five years a 0.3% decline in the fertility of your country. That is, ideas about what is normal, what is right, are flowing through migrant networks. And let me underline that every single one of these effects that I've talked about, technology, trade, FDI, norms, institutions, is flowing through networks of people, independently of whether or not those people physically go home. In fact, if you think about it, precisely because some of those people do not physically go home. So let's go back to Mo Ibrahim. He has mobilized billions of dollars of investment in Africa. He has catalyzed the transfer of technology en masse to Africa. He's catalyzed trade between Africa and the rest of the world and between African countries through the technologies that he brought to Africa. He's done mass philanthropy in Africa. His wife opened a cancer hospital in Khartoum. He arguably is working on improving governance in Africa through his governance prize. And even less tangibly, think about the, just the inspiration that lots and lots of kids looking at what he did got for themselves to imagine, you know, what could I do with my life? And yet, as I mentioned, the traditional agenda would only ask, did he go home to work as an engineer in the National Telecoms Agency, and how much did he wire to his cousins? It's time to really move beyond that. Um, I'm an economics geek. I spend my time reading these papers and writing them. I think a lot of this is just intuitive. I think we know it already. In, in honor of, of our uh, Turkish host, I want to quote the great contemporary author Elif Shafak, uh, who said, and I'll say in my bad Turkish, Bir şey yok etmek istiyorsanız, tek yapmanız gereken onu kalın duvarlarla çevrelemektir. If you want to destroy something, all you have to do is surround it with thick walls. We understand that the development of, of, of complex systems require flows and interchange. Uh, when people ask me what's the effect of migration on development, I, I, I think of it like this. What, what's the effect of blood on the body, on a developing baby like this one? I mean. In one sense, it's a meaningful question. You could say, well, blood carries oxygen around. You could even measure the effect. But in another sense, it's a ridiculous question. Blood is part of the body. The, the body grows and develops to the extent that blood flows, and blood flows to the extent that the body grows and develops. That's the relationship between migration and development. And if you have a development plan for your child that doesn't involve blood flow, your child's in big trouble. If we have a development plan for the world that doesn't involve the circulation of people, doesn't even mention it in anything but negative terms, then our plans are in trouble. And uh, I thank you very much for your time.